morning everyone thank you for tuning in so uh my name is liliana hora and we just want to welcome you to our first ever retaining girls in sport workshop um so obviously athletics ireland and rowing ireland are very thankful for the support and funding from sport ireland that has allowed us to actually meet you here today in this virtual workshop but before we begin we must thank each and every one of you for tuning in because you are continuing to support and advocate for women in sport which is obviously something that's very important to us all we're obviously very overwhelmed with the support uh, for this workshop. We had over 300 people register for the workshop and unfortunately we did have to say no to a few of you. Uh, but thank you for all for all your early registrations and getting a place in. Um, we find it really extremely heartening to see so many of you wanting to make a real difference for your sport and for your current and obviously future members. So Rowing Ireland and Athletics Ireland, we both have a shared responsibility to do more for women in sport, and which we can clearly see that all of you have done and welcomed and embraced with open arms. Both Claire and myself have really enjoyed seeing some of the work that's been done in your own clubs and your communities and with your coaches, um, which we will share throughout the workshop. We also acknowledge that the retainment of all our members, not just girls, not just women, is really important, but reducing the incidence of dropout amongst our young girls is necessary and vital for the progress of both our sports. We hope that you enjoy this workshop and that it gives you a clearer vision and obviously understanding of what we can do to support our female members and facilitate each and every one of your commitment to women in sport. And we also want to thank Orla for sharing her research and findings with us today, because no doubt you will be able to relate and learn from her work. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lillianne and I'm working with Athletics Ireland as the Women in Sport Officer. We have Claire Lamb from Cork, Olympian turned Women in Sport lead. And for those of you who don't know, she was sixth in the Olympics in Rio de Janeiro in the lightweight women's double skulls with her partner Sinead Lynch. Um, we also have Dr. Orla Farmer here, and Orla is a lecturer in sport um, education and early childhood studies in Dundalk IT, and she's also a qualified PE teacher teaching down in Cork at the moment, and was re recently awarded her doctorate in UCC, um, and her PhD research has focused on retaining girls in sport, specifically in GAA, um, but she's also a, a very nifty uh, footballer as well, and six-time um, All-Ireland champion with Cork as well, but we won't hold that against her. So what we're going to do, I'll just leave you over to Claire for the moment before she takes over and we welcome you all and thank you so much for tuning in. Just to reiterate what Lillian said, it is so heartening to see so many people um, join us this evening. Uh, so yeah, like Lillian said, 300 people registered and that got full by last week. And when we actually looked at the number of different sports entered, whilst we had in intended that this was uh, geared towards athletics and rowing, 22 different sports signed up, um, which we think is fantastic and we feel that Orla Farmer's research is probably applicable to all sports. So in the registration, we asked um, you guys basically two questions. So what you thought were the biggest challenges in retaining girls in your sport, in your club, and also then what strategies do your club implement to retain girls in sports? So, just to kind of summarize some of the feedback that we, we got from that, um, there was kind of uh, a, a lot of varying answers around the biggest challenges, but um, some of the most common ones were kind of peer and social pressure, conflict with other sports, or girls losing a lack of interest, and particularly academic pressure as well. Um, some kind of interesting quotes that uh, some of the attendees said were, girls at lower levels than the average standard can find it difficult to keep playing as they get older, or girls finding it hard to get girls to stay and transition from non-competitive to competitive. Then under strategies, the two main or most common kind of themes of, of the commentary that we got back from attendance was the coach-athlete relationship. And we'll talk more about that um, in Orla's presentation, but that can be all aspects of that, building that relationship between the coach and the athlete. And then another main strategy that you guys are identifying is making it fun. And again, I think Orla will speak to that uh, throughout her presentation. So two uh, strategies that I thought were quite interesting that clubs were doing was promoting friendship to try and get girls to compete and train at the right level for their ability that allows them to gain confidence. And then also to try to keep at 
keep athletics fun. Although we help girls to achieve their best in competition, the focus is not on winning medals. It's about enjoying the sport and training and the camaraderie. And finally, what was also interesting was that 30 of you said you didn't have a strategy for retaining girls in your, in your club. Um, and one, we even had one reply that was, when asked what strategy they were implementing, they said, you tell me. So I think that really introduces it well to kick off this uh, presentation tonight. Thanks. So guys, just to follow up and so that we have an idea of what's to come throughout this webinar with Orla, Claire and myself. Aim is to obviously understand the motivations, values and barriers that young girls experience in sport. So not just athletics and not just rowing, this is all sport. Aim two, to recognise best practices that Lillian frozen there. And so too soon. What I'm going to leave you to do is going to hand you over to Orla now so that he can get stuck in. So what I'm going to do is just stop sharing my screen, Orla. Perfect. Thank you. Can you see? Yes. Perfect. Okay, good evening everyone. Um, absolutely delighted to be on this webinar. Um, thank you very much, Claire and Lillian, for the introduction. Um, I suppose it's always like a great opportunity. Um, always happy to share like some of my own research and playing experience. Um, I suppose, you know, being a female um, playing at a high level, but also doing the research um, to back it up. So um, I would hope that um, you know I'm excited to share some some of the research insights and some of my own personal insights, um, so that by the end of the webinar you will go will go home with um, some some tools and and tips to to help you retain girls in your own club. So I suppose for the purpose of today, I'm not working. So today's presentation will be in three parts. So first of all, we're going to look at putting yourself in her shoes. So we're going to look at the notion of like understanding participation, motivators, barriers, and what the research says. The second part, we're going to look at the power of the coach. So we're going to focus on you as a coach and how you can, I suppose, enhance that coach-athlete relationship and look at the whole idea of social cohesion and team cohesion and whatnot and so we'll share some practical tips and strategies that you can use um, to I suppose promote and enhance that coach athlete relationship um, and lastly then we're going to look at I suppose the whole notion of the practical coach strategies so we're actually going to give you an opportunity to speak with each other and um, we're going to give you a scenario based activity and for eight minutes you'll get a chance to be in a breakout room um, just to discuss, I suppose, different strategies that you would, I suppose, suggest um, and what, things that you, you would use in your own clubs as well. Um, so I suppose part one is going to look at understanding our athletes. Um, and when I mean that, I mean, like, this is, is what the research is saying. So I suppose my own background um, is heavily revolved around research. I just recently submitted or defended my PhD in UCC and it focused on the whole area of this was what motivates girls to stay involved in physical activity and sport, what's stopping them from, you know, what, what's in the way um, and also how can we try and get girls more involved. And I'm also a researcher with um, Sport Ireland on um, a recent physical literacy uh, project. So in um, the last few, few weeks I've been looking at Irish studies as, um, and seeing what girls uh, particularly children and adolescents, what, what they think about physical activity in sport. I'm actually very, very excited to share some of those findings with you today um, and hopefully you can learn something. 
So just before um, I, I delve into the research, um, I just, uh, this video it was a recent video up on the 2020 campaign. I'm sure you're all aware of this campaign at the moment that's all about promoting female sport participation. Um, and I think it's, it's just quite um, effective and it's only a minute long um, and I'd like to share this video with you just to get an insight again into putting yourself in her shoes um, from Kyla's perspective. It's a little bit jumpy at the moment, Orla. Um, I don't know if it's jumping for everyone else, but it's kind of jumping up for me at the moment. It Hi Orla, I think um, there's just an issue with the video at the moment, it's kind of jumping and muting at the moment, so I'd say we might have to leave the video for the moment. We can share it um, with the group after. Perfect, no problem. Apologies. Uh, sorry about that. No, that's okay. Sorry about that, guys. Um, guaranteed to have some sort of um, difficulties with technology. Um, that's no problem. You can look at it anyway on YouTube. Um, just some of the 2020 campaign videos are very effective and get more of an insight into I suppose, what goes on in a young girl's head and what they think about sport and physical activity. Um, so I suppose just before I, I delve in, into the research. Um, I'd just like to give you a quick background. So, um, as I've said, I'm, I'm going to present now findings from 30 studies um, in Ireland over the last 10 years. So these are qualitative studies. So studies that have interviewed girls specifically on physical activity and sport participation. So, you know, you're talking about close to a thousand, if not more, um, students in, in Ireland and, and, and children and adolescents in Ireland. Um, now, some of the, the findings are applicable to boys as well, but just for the purpose of this presentation, um, we're just going to focus on, on the female perspective. So I suppose when asked, when the girls were asked, like, why do you participate in sport? Um, what motivates you to participate in sport? So six key themes I suppose, came out and emerged through the research. So what Irish children and adolescents um, have said. So this is actually research informed. Um, and the number one thing, um, surprise, surprise, is fun. Uh, so I suppose um, children and adolescents express that whole desire that training um, you know, needs to be fun, play for the pure enjoyment and the fun aspect. Uh, the whole idea of social interaction. So, you know, I suppose we're social beings and we, lo we love to be around people and we thrive around people. Typically for girls, this is really, really important. Um, girls like to be with their friends. Um, you know, they like to be associated with their friends. They like to conform, typically as they transition from primary school to secondary school. So um, they like to be accepted by their friends. Um, and peer influence typically has that really, really strong um, influence over, like, you know, why they're staying involved or why they're dropping out of sport. Um, other social interaction there would include like the coach um, and parent and significant others, role models, etc. Um, but that's really, really important and motivates young girls. Um, thirdly, uh, when asked again, you know, why, why do you play sport? Um, why bother? And they said, they want to compete, they want competitive edges there, they want to better themselves, they want to get the best out of themselves. To, to be fit and healthy was another response. So I suppose children and adolescents recognise the, the, I suppose the health consequences and the physical consequences of physical activity and sport. And that's one main reason as well why they want to be involved. And another reason uh, cited was that of mental health and to relieve stress. So children and adolescents um, girls in Ireland express why they they want to be involved is because it's I suppose that kind of outlet for them and not only socially and with their friends and to have fun but also that whole idea of I feel better and it's kind of you know it clears my head as well and finally um children and adolescents really kind of uh, in their responses this whole notion of community involvement and like being part of a community this sense of like 
belongingness and connectedness and, and community of practice. So that, that was really important to them, which probably links as well to the whole idea of um, the social interaction as well. Um, but again, just to, to highlight that the, this is coming from a child and adolescent's perspective. These are the main findings based on 30 research published studies in Ireland in the last 10 years. Um, and you're talking about an age range of three to 18 years, uh, years, of, years old uh, girls. So this was just to delve in a bit more in terms of, of the motivators. It was, I'm gonna just take you through the, the top three um, because they're very important and they seem to come up a lot in research. Um, and that the first layer is fun and friends. So you'll see some direct quotes Throughout the presentation, these are direct quotes from the published studies um, in Ireland. So if you can see here, um, you know, I like having fun with my friends. They defend your back. Um, the whole idea of like, first of all, participating with your friends, um, that's coming through. But also the whole idea of like, you know, I, I play because it, it's an opportunity to meet new friends as well. Um, so, and they want to have fun and they want to win and they want to compete with their friends as well. So like friends really can have a really, really positive influence. However, they can have a negative influence as well, which I'll be taking through, you through in a minute in the barriers. I suppose like really from a coaching perspective, like it's so, so important to understand like your athletes and like putting yourself in her shoes. So like I'm taking you through the research, but just be mindful in each slide of like, you know, this is what like, the, the girls in Ireland, they're, they're actually expressing this. So just be mindful of that in terms of like, how do you bring fun and, and friends into your, your coaching? Do, do you allow time for, for that whole social interaction in your coaching? We will be going through some practical um, tips for it, like at the end of the presentation as well. Um, and hopefully by the end of it, you'll have more of an idea of how you can implement this whole notion of like the social aspect and fun as well because fun can be quite an elusive term you know it can be quite broad um and I think some people think as well that fun like just because it's fun doesn't mean it's not competitive um and it's all about getting the balance there between being fun and, and competitive um mm -hmm. also just I think we, we forgot to mention like feel free to, to just jot in some questions into the chat as well as, as we go through the slides if you have any questions just pop them in the chat. Um, Claire and Lillian will moderate the questions um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have as well throughout the presentation. So number one, the number one reason why they want to be involved is they want to have fun and enjoy the sport and they want to be with their friends. Well, the second thing is that of, um, you know, that whole idea of competing and wanting to get better, fun to win. Um, children have expressed that needs like that it, it actually is fun to win um, it can be like the too competitiveness nature can actually be a, a barrier as well which I'll speak about in a minute but I suppose what's coming during the research is that athletes and children they, they, they find it fun um, to win and compete um, and also giving you that drive um, to get the best out of yourself as well so just like I was saying with the first slide like we don't necessarily have to separate fun and, and competition like it can be both um, and I know from my own perspective of, of with Cork ladies footballers over the last um it's my 11th year now on the panel and um, like I mean obviously we've been winning all Ireland so yes it has been very competitive and you're trying to fight for your position on, on that starting 15 but still like when I look back at the, the most enjoyable training sessions they're the ones I can remember when we had fun um, and when I suppose you were bait coming off the pitch but she still had a smile on your face so you can merge the two together and it's all about really just getting that, that balance between fun and competition. And the, the third thing that they, I suppose that was coming up a lot through the research was that whole idea of like feeling healthy and again that the physical, the emotional, um, the mental consequences of taking part in sports of being happy with themselves you know they like to hear their heart pumping and their, the blood pumping around and it takes your mind off things so like they see sport as this like outlet that they can they, they feel better as a result of taking part in training taking part in whatever sport they're, they're doing that they they acknowledge that that physical emotional um, and mental 
and psychological, I suppose, as well, consequence and effect that, that it has on them. And which is really important because um, knowing that, you know, that will help with their intrinsic motivation as well to, to want to come back for the next training session. In terms of barriers, um, I know now I'm flying through with the motivators and the barriers, but I just like I just feel it's important to be aware like of what youth, I suppose, what they want and what they don't want and why they're dropping out. So again, based on the research, so I'm basing this off 30 um, peer-reviewed published studies in Ireland in the last decade, so since 2010, um, including my own research studies as well. Um, and this is what is coming through. So like, it's fantastic that it's not just me lecturing what I think, this is actually, I'm speaking on behalf of Irish youth and adolescents. So the first thing coming up, um, and now again, this, these are in no particular order. Um, this is just what, um, this is just presented as an overall um, barriers and, uh, and why they're dropping out, why, are, why they're quitting. So fun is gone. So again, like on one side, you have, right, they want to be there and they play because they enjoy it and they want to have fun. Yet on the other side, ironically, they're dropping out of, of sport because the, the fun is gone. They're, it's lacking enjoyment. The coaches are too strict. Um, that, that negative kind of relationship with the coach can be a massive um, barrier and it can actually be a reason why athletes drop out um, of sport. Um, that's coming through in the literature and the research as well. So like, again, be mindful like that you you as a coach have such like an impact, whether that be positive, whether that be negative, like you have a massive role to play in terms of like the decision between staying involved or dropping out. Um, why? This is what's coming up. You know, children have expressed that they're dropping out because the coach, the coaches are too strict, the fun is gone, um, and that whole kind of negativity is creeping in between the coach athlete relationship. Too competitive. So again, on one side, we see in the motivators that athletes they want to they want to get the best of themselves, they want to compete. Um, however, the balance maybe isn't right the whole time. And another big reason why athletes are dropping out. Now, some of these reasons are actually quite interlinked. Um, so like for example, the fun might be be gone, which means that you know it could be too competitive as well. And coaches are too strict. So some of these are, are interlinked. Um, but again, like it's just really, really important to put yourself in your athlete's shoes and understand like why are they dropping out. So I suppose too competitive again, they're broad terms as well. Um, but like as a result, I mean that could link into lack of confidence. It could link into lack of fun. It could link into just a dislike for the coach, etc. As well, negative influence of friends is another thing that's coming through. So um, on one side, again, we have the positive influence of friends. However, not as, as much as the negative influence as well. Friends, um, again, like to conform and they like to be accepted. Um, bullying can be been this whole notion of comparing each other, like social comparison. Um, we all see it. Um, you know, it does unfortunately creep in. Um, but as a coach, again, be mindful of that. You know, what, what can you do in your club? Um, if you see this whole negative influence of friends, which we'll talk about later on in the presentation. Body image concerns, lack of confidence, um, children, or children and teenagers particularly, it's, it's, a, it's a very tricky time. Um, a massive transition really in terms of not only the physiological effects on their body, but also you know, the social aspects, the mental, um, the emotional. Other commitments is coming through, lack of time, um, demands of schoolwork, some teenagers have part-time jobs and essentially they just don't have time as they express in, in the research and the literature um, other things come in the way so whether that be other, other sports that they're involved in um, and in general due to school and study um, parents as well could be putting pressure externally as well. Lack of choice interestingly um, I suppose this one comes in in, in the sense that like Coaches can be too strict, you know, they can be maybe a bit too authoritative, um, not meeting the sessions, might be meeting the needs and interests of, of, of athletes. And um, so lack of choice and kind of lack of input into kind of, I'm not saying they have to plan the whole session or anything, but just that lack of kind of a child's voice 
um, in terms of like the session, planning the sessions and things like that. And of course, the weather, typical in Ireland, um, this is a, a big one and look, it's something we probably can't control to a certain extent. Um, you know, not every club has indoor facilities. Um, pruning, and five minutes later, it could be snowing in Ireland. That's just what we, we have to put up with. Um, so that can be a barrier as well. You know, children don't like getting wet in the rain. They don't like sometimes getting muck on them. Um, and that can kind of link to body image as well. So again, these are the top kind of barriers that are coming through when asked, why are they quitting sport? And Orla, I just have one or two questions uh, just regarding kind of the barriers and the research here. Uh, what age group was it that this research was done on exactly? I know you said that you'd done it over. You're talking about, um, sorry, uh, you're talking about primary school and secondary school, so um, junior infants, uh, um, 18 year olds. All the way. Yeah, yeah, all the way up. Um, and what you see is like, even when you look at, say, the younger cohort of children, um, very similar to the, the older cohort. Um, a few things change, all right, when they, when they transition into the, the secondary school, say, environment, um, and when they kind of go into adolescence, like, um, but generally, like, primary school and post-primary school, they, they, the same things are coming through um, from the younger cohort and the older cohort as well. And is there somewhere that would we be able to get links to some of this research for after for participants to read up on? Yeah, absolutely. You can follow up with me. Um, my email will be in the final slide and, and I'd be happy to share all the links to all the studies um, that I've been working on the last few weeks. And so I've actually collated, like I've done my research, I've purchased studies um, that were, and I have no problem. Orla, what I might do, two things. Um, I might just ask you to turn off your own, um, your your video at the moment because it's just kind of jumping at the moment. Um, and I, like one of the other final questions that I had is just that, you know, the, some of these barriers here, there's obviously a lot going on for people, but were some of the answers more prevalent than others or were they kind of much the same throughout? Yeah, um, I'm actually going to be taking, um, I'll, I'll be going through the, the key barriers in the next few slides now. So these were the, the main ones that were coming out. Um, obviously, there are numerous barriers, like there's not one specific because everybody is different. But I will be taking the next few slides are going to go through the main barriers. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. So one of the, the main barriers was um, expressed from, from the children and adolescents was that of lack of enjoyment and it's it too competitive um i mean it's it, again and once they, they want it to be they want it to be, it to be competitive but when it gets too competitive um they seem to just lack that enjoyment and 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 drop out so again these are direct quotes from the participants i just thought it was way too strict like it wasn't fun some people get a bit too competitive and that kind of like makes you feel not that confident so again you can see the social comparison even coming in there from the themselves to others and it, like that competitive environment uh, for girls can actually impede uh, participation as well. The negative influence of friends, again, that was, com that was one of the main barriers out of all of them coming through. Friends that you know are judgmental and they'll, they'll say stuff about you afterwards. I was in a club, but then my friend quit, so I didn't want to do it anymore on my own. So a whole kind of maybe, the, not even bullying, but and of again, that social judgment and comparison was coming in. And also what we're seeing a lot, like a trend we're seeing a lot in the literature is that if your friends are dropping out, um, then you're more than likely going to drop out. Now that's not always the case. And I can speak for that myself. Um, when I started playing football in this class in school, three of my friends asked me to, to join the local club in, in Middleton. Um, and about a year or two later, those three girls dropped out of the sport. Um, and I continued on playing and still playing to this day. So it's not always the case for athletes. Um, you know, I suppose you, you do have to question the motivation, I suppose, there as well and other factors. But um, we are seeing a trend in the literature that if friends are dropping out, um, then that, that athlete, you know, nine times out of ten might drop out as well. Um, lack of confidence as well. Is, is a big thing for girls who aren't good so you just stop doing it and some people like I can't think of the words but you lose your confidence so again you know whether that be skill related whether it be body image related um 
different factors there are coming into play and confidence is a massive one. Um, that feel good factor is so, so important as a coach. Um, and you need to be mindful of that. And, you know, I suppose it's your job essentially as a coach to instill that confidence and give girls that opportunity. And, um, you know, whether it be through praise, um, encouragement, which we'll be speaking about over the next few slides, and strategies that you can kind of implement um, in your training sessions to try and enhance that, that confidence. Because at the end of the day, like you want your athletes to be confident and you want them to be feel good about themselves and that feel good factor because that's really going to work, work on their motivation, particularly their internal motivation. Um, the fourth one, um, and it's a big one as well, is that, that idea of schoolwork and studying. Uh, that perceived pressure, but also the external pressure from teachers, from parents, um, and from themselves as well. You know, athletes can push pressure on themselves as well. We get lots of homework and I just don't have time. We'll be in school all day, then study after school. And um, so we can see there like that, you know, it, it, to a certain extent, it's like we can't really control that, um, particularly for the students that are in kind of the exam years. Um, and maybe that pressure is coming from home as well. Um, so again, like just as a coach, be mindful and be aware that look like sport yes it's it's a massive part of the athlete's life but it still it still is only one aspect um of of their lifestyle and there's a lot more going on particularly going into the teenagers so what we we're seeing is um one of the main reasons coming into say first second third year um is that the, the schoolwork is kind of upping and increasing and there's more of a demand there and there's, there's more pressure there as opposed to the younger generation. Uh, the, the next thing that was coming through was that of um, other sports. Um, so again, obviously look like athletes that would be involved in three or four sports, particularly at a, at a younger age. And um, that's again, something you can't control. Like you just have to, I suppose, know that that they have other things going on um and also just not to kind of like burn them out and things like that that like look if say for myself if orla has football going on with school um she also plays um mogi uh with her school team and with the local team and then she is involved in the athletics club as well or the rowing club like just be mindful of that that look athletes do have things going on as well um, outside and that coming into the, the adolescence period, work, part-time work and things like that can come into play. Um, so if athletes aren't turning up to training, um, they're working as well. So look, again, that's not something really you can control. You can alleviate the pressure, absolutely, as a coach, but um, like things like part-time work and involvement in other sports um, would usually be encouraged at a younger age. Um, so just to be mindful of that as well. Um, the next and the final thing in terms of barriers is that of um, body image and confidence. So body image can be quite a sensitive issue for girls, uh, particularly again as we come into the adolescence period, um, even pre-adolescence. So you've been talking about say 11, 12 year old girls all the way up to 18 uh, plus girls as well. Um, fitness may make some athletes embarrassed. Um, those eating disorders can kind of be a concern as well as uh, social media has a massive impact you know instagram tiktok looking at all these influencers you know having that kind of perfect body and a six pack and things like that girls can be quite conscious of that and those perceived pressures to kind of conform to society and to look good and um, to have that six pack to have that perfect athletic body um girls can be quite sensitive and and, and um, conscious of that as well. So again, as a coach, being aware of that. Um, I have sports bras and athletic here down here as well. Something that you probably don't think of as a coach, but girls particularly can be quite conscious of that, um, particularly like in changing room environments. And um, I have white shorts down because I suppose it, when it's the time of the month for girls, girls can be quite conscious of that. And like I'm speaking on, on behalf of my own experience as well. Like I know even some girls senior level and um, at an elite level would still be conscious when it's like the time of the month in terms of like wearing white shorts um, and things like that as well so just be mindful of that um menstruation can can affect performance as well so in terms of physical performance mentally psychologically and um, 
all, all of that can can come into play and can actually like be a big barrier for girls. Um, girls are kind of they, they might hold back in expressing, you know, why they're not being a training, um, things like that. Makeup and tan, I have done as well because I suppose in this day and age, um, girls feel like they want to, you know, feel good about themselves. And like why I have that down there is that like you know what if they do have the makeup and tan on, leave them off. And they, if if that makes them feel good about themselves. Don't like don't really make remarks about that. I would kind of avoid making remarks about kind of appearance related issues, um, particularly things that are quite sensitive. In terms of menstruation, like again, I'm not going to go into detail here, but I, I do feel it's important to just make um, particularly the male coaches aware of um, just the effect, the negative effects that it can actually have on athletes. Um, and again, can be can impede them in terms of their performance. Um, things like you know cramps. Uh, athletes might feel a bit, you know more tired, um, not energized. Um, you know headaches. All of these kind of negative side effects. Um, a study recently um, reported that three and four elite female athletes actually reported that they experienced negative side effects while on their period. So again, like I'm just giving this information to you, it's out of your control, but like just be sensitive in terms of like remarks, your body language. Um, and like particularly for girls, you know, if girls aren't turning off to training sessions, um, you know, maybe it is the time of the month as well. Um, so just be mindful of that. So what can you do as a coach in this situation in terms, particularly in terms of the body image? Um, so I would definitely say um, just keep kind of Private and um, don't be kind of obviously making remarks and be sensitive towards girls' issues in terms of like the menstrual cycle. Um, there are apps and stuff out there, like Fit or Women and stuff that can help track apps and educate girls on you know what they can do to try and and, and enhance their performance when they have their period, etc. Um, or else like something practical, like look, I know. From my own perspective, I probably would be more comfortable speaking with a female coach or a female assistant or a parent that's helping out in the club. Um, if something, if, if there's an issue there, um, and like, look, make that available. You know, I suppose stress that and have that open communication as a coach to, to help them and, and make sure that it's a safe environment so that that athletes can express um, if there if there are certain sensitive issues coming into play. Um, I suppose really just kind of promoting that culture that you know no one size fits all as well, and um, that like obviously, um, every athlete is different. You know, um, every athlete is has a different body composition, etc. Um, and that just to stress and highlight that that like you know to focus on the positives and focus on on the performance rather than kind of remarking on appearance related kind of issues. Keep your eyes and ears open at all times and remember that smaller marks can actually have a massive impact um, on the athlete as well. Um, I'm sure you're all aware anyway like, uh, of, of that. Um, but just that smaller mark can actually go like in, in a negative light as well um, and can be a reason why girls can drop out as well. So just be sensitive. I think just girls in general are more sensitive to boys. And so just be sensible um, in terms of remarks and things like that and feedback and um, praise and things like that. So again, final kind of comment, you do not have to leave your femininity at the door in order to play sports. So like it should be, a, it should be attractive for girls to play sports. I know like some girls might be conscious of like gaining muscle um, and things like that, but like it, it, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter like as in leave them on, leave them have their tan on, leave them have their designer gear or whatever it is they wear, whatever makes them feel comfortable and whatever makes them feel good about themselves and um, should be I suppose promoted in, in the club environment. So that moves us on now to the power of the coach. So I just really want to focus on I guess was your role and get you to reflect upon first of all why you coach um, and second of all the, the, the impact, the really important impact that you have um, on your your athletes, whether that be in a positive light, or unfortunately that can also be a negative light as well. So I have two pictures up here with two quotes. Um, again, these quotes have come from the Irish literature. So 
on one side we have I suppose that whole positive kind of influence and on the other side we have that negative influence and these are direct quotes from the participants in the studies, in the Irish studies. So if you had a nice coach or something, they don't act like a coach, they act more like a friend to you instead. So that's really kind of, I suppose, depicting like that real positive kind of friendship and that bond between the coach athlete relationship that, you know, if, if athletes are, are kind of, if they acknowledge that and if, if they see you as someone that, I suppose, I wouldn't say like a friend friend, but like someone that they're comfortable with talking to, um, in that positive light that you know that really has a positive effect on an athlete and um, on the other side like again this is coming through if there's a really mean coach i'd probably stop the sport because they'd give out to you so like, you can see like that it's it can be the difference like your coaching style and your coaching demeanor whether that be positive or negative can actually be the the, the deciding factor whether an athlete stays involved or drops out of sport like that in itself shows that like just the power that you have to make that positive influence um and retain your girls as well in court um so just again like be reflective here like which in other words which coach do you want to be of course we want to be the nice coach of course we want to be the positive coach of course we want to be that inspirational coach and that role model for our girls um so that we can stay involved remember one of the big um, motivators that was coming through was that of the social interaction for girls. So like the coach falls under that category. Like, so you need to, as a coach athlete in that relationship, like you need to provide that positive platform, safe, positive platform that, you know, your, your athletes feel like that, that bond is there and that connectedness is there and they feel comfortable and they feel safe um, with that whole coach athlete relationship every youngster and coach should have an effective and positive relationship that which includes an empathetic understanding honesty support cooperation and respect so all of these kind of ingredients say you need to merge all these ingredients in order to have that effective and positive coach athlete relationship um, now again I know, I know you know that but it's just more of like highlighting that like it's so so important your role as a coach in terms of influencing your athletes so we're just going to focus for a bit here um, and I suppose the whole notion of understanding your athletes um, and how you're as a team, but we're going to, we're going to look at the, some practical strategies and some practical examples. So I'm going to focus first on communication and how important it is to communicate. Um, how can you get to know your athletes? So in the first few slides of this presentation, I, pre I presented the motivators and the barriers. Um, so like, you should really like the first step is you should really know your athletes so I would pose the question first do you know your athletes like how well do you know your athletes do you know what they like do you know what they dislike and um, do you know what motivates them do you know what what kind of gets in the way what don't they like what could potentially be uh, a barrier in terms of them dropping out so like communication is so important there and when I mean communication I mean speaking with them speaking with your, your athletes, speaking with your, uh, with their parents as well. Norla, can I, yeah. can I make a point on that? Just like you said about communication. I think a big thing as well is like knowing why your athlete is actually there because many of, especially with girls, you know, sometimes they mightn't be as competitive or the word that I like to use is discreetly competitive. They don't let you know all their business all the time, but they go about it and keep the head down. So it's just being aware that they mightn't be as vocal and they mightn't be as boisterous as some of the other participants in their training groups, but they might be, you know, quietly motivated and want to compete or not want to compete. But understanding why they show up every day would be a big, big thing for you. Um, because you do, there's no point pushing them to compete, for example, if they don't want to compete. They might be there just because they're enjoying the craft, because they like the club hoodie. It's simple things like that that what motivates them to come along to your sessions. So just like I said, a big, big awareness of why they're actually there and why they're actually showing up to meet you. Yeah, and like I think that's a great point, Lillian. Um, I think the whole notion I have it there on the right, just about assumptions. Like never assume. Like you can ne never assume that your athlete wants to, you know, 
compete in an All-Ireland or in, obviously, most of the athletes were, are there because they want to get the best. But, you know, not all of your athletes will want to represent their county, will want to represent their, their country as well. So, again, that comes down to not assuming and actually asking. Like, and it, it's, it's something simple. I mean, whether that be, like, just informally talking to them, like, at the start of returning sports, after a training session, whether that be just, you know, the parents, just having a little chat, an informal chat with the parents, um, things like that, that you can actually just get to know them. Um, like I always say, even just from my own coaching experience, that if you pick, like even pick four or five athletes, you're not going to get around to all your athletes in, in one training session. So maybe pick four or five athletes uh, every training session, four different ones every training session, and make that conscious effort to go around and get to know them. Um, get to know, you know, what they like, what their personalities are like, or so, uh, another alternative is maybe, you know, you could do a questionnaire, you could do a survey, you could hold a, a meeting, you could hold a, a Zoom meeting, you could hold a meeting, um, and, and just get them to, to see exactly what, what they want, how they're feeling, how they're finding training, um, you know, what do they need to work on, etc. So you, you really, really need to get to know your athletes, don't just assume. The second thing really I want to bring to your attention is purposeful praise and encouragement. So like it's so, so important, particularly for girls. And um, I think like with because that whole lack of confidence is coming through um, in the barriers, like it's so important to kind of try and foster that confidence in the girls. Um, and, and by doing that, you can purposefully praise and encourage them. And what I mean by purposefully praise is like be really specific, you know, um, obviously encourage them and, and be positive but like in terms of like feedback and encouragement like don't just tell the athlete what you want them to do versus what you do like you need to be positive in your demeanor so for I have an example here instead of just kind of focusing on the negatives like don't drop your elbow or don't do this um a better approach would be like look Orla I think you need to keep your your elbow a bit higher on the right side but the left side looks good that's just a specific example that you're not just saying don't do this or never do this or you shouldn't do this. Like don't just start with the negative. Um, I always try and have like this language effect. That, like you can just start with positive, you bring in your constructive feedback, um, but always end with 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 that positive because like straight away, athletes, like even just that language, like even just saying don't, like at a subconscious level, can be really off-putting for athletes as well particularly girls and girls can be very sensitive to that, that kind of negative language just again to be mindful of that when you're praising and um, when you're encouraging your athletes don't just kind of over praise either you know don't be kind of like over praising everyone like oh well done Mary well done Sarah well done Orla like too much because it's not as effective then um, and the athletes mightn't deem it as important if you're kind of over praising and giving too much feedback and too much kind of encouragement. So as a coach, be mindful of the following tone of language. So how you say something is just as important as what you say. So the nonverbal communication there, the body language, the facial ex expressions, the gestures, you know, always just display that kind of calmness and positive demeanor. Um, really, really important for, for girls. I, I know just from my own experience, um, uh, Eamon Ryan used to coach us with the Cork Ladies footballers through the years um, and you know I suppose when we were at our best and when we were winning all Ireland and um, like something I always just remember with Eamon is that his demeanour as a coach just really calm and um, despite the result you know despite if there was a if we were behind in the middle of a game like never shouted at the line just always really calm but was very I suppose constructive in his feedback and things like that as well but that's just something that I remember um, and it was really effective and I think it's really effective as a coach to have that skill and um, your body language will give everything away really uh, constructive purposeful feedback so instead of you always giving the feedback allow the players to actually get, get, get feedback as well so ask them some questions open-ended questions you know how can we improve the next time um get them maybe amongst each other whether it be in pairs whether it be in groups of three you know if a drill or if a skill or if an activity in your training session didn't go well maybe just stop it up for a minute and just say right girls okay we're going to just go into groups of three there now and i want us to just 
reflect on that activity. What do you think we did well there? Um, how do you think we can improve for the next activity? Or we're going to do it again, right? That wasn't, you know, I think we can do better as a group. I think we can all do better in this activity. How do you think we can improve? So put the onus on them as well. Like instead of being very authoritative, and I know as a coach, you want to like be in control and you want to be the one always kind of telling and showing, but it's really, really effective if you actually like give the onus on the players as well. And they appreciate that because now they're included in the process and they feel, you know, anonymous. They will want to contribute, you know, and, and, and straight away that's going to engage them. That's going to engage their internal motivation. It's going to engage their external motivation. And again, it's the perfect opportunity to be social. That, that's another example of, of allowing for social interaction in your training sessions. Um, you could kill two birds with the one stone. Some don't want to be in the spotlight. And I think that's an important point to note as well. Like just avoid singling people out um, and this whole notion of favoritism as well. Um, like I know even from my own experience growing up playing football, um, I, even, even if you do something good, sometimes I still don't like to be singled out. Um, and I know even from my own friends and what the research is saying as well is that girls sometimes, whether it be positive or whether it be negative, girls actually sometimes don't like being in the spotlight. Um, I, and again, that probably plays into that whole idea of like the social comparison and things like that. Um, get mad at it. I always say, look, get mad at it. Don't be too authoritative. Don't be too in control. Like allow them to be a bit instinctive as well. Um, if, if things aren't going right the way you had planned, like, don't kind of react in a negative way. Don't be shouting at them, telling them, oh, you should be doing X, Y, and Z. Nobody likes to be shouted at. Um, don't blame or point fingers. Again, Hi, Orla. Are... Don't know if you can hear yeah. me, but I think we've lost you there for a second. Uh... Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine, actually, Lillian. Um, I don't know if it was just your... Can you hear me now? Please. I can hear you, Orla. Perfect. You can hear Perfect. Oh, yeah. Right, sorry, back. Lillian. I think it's sorry, too soon. Now there's me just chatting away to myself. Ignore me, lads. Sorry. Off. Lovely. <laughs> um, so again, just to reiterate, I'm not sure where I cut off. Um, but like, just as a coach, be mindful of all of this. Um, your body language, how you use your feedback. So don't always be the person giving the feedback. Allow the the player, the players, or the athletes to um get the feedback as well. Um, and then again, that's a nice way to get to know the players. And it's 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 the perfect response to allow them to solve. Some don't want to be in the spotlight, so avoid that singling out. And um, whether it be positive praise or feedback or negative, obviously, like girls just don't really appreciate that. Um, and I think the whole idea of favoritism as well can be a negative kind of a impediment coming in because you know girls will take notice of that. Um, and it could it could be it could pose as a barrier too. Let them be at it, you know, let them be instinctive. Don't always be the one authoritative, in control all of the time. Let them kind of have some some kind of loose time um, and le let them be instinctive as well and let them kind of come up with their own conclusions. Don't always be the one telling them what to do. Don't blame or point fingers and always focus on the issue, not the person. I'm sure you know that anyway, but again, just be really, really mindful of that. Um, something that was coming through in the research as well is giving girls a voice and a choice. Now, I mean, when, when, I, when I say that, I mean kind of that provision of choice in activity content. So obviously you as a coach, you're going to be prepared. You're going to have your plan um, when you're coming to training. But sometimes, I'm not saying always, but like sometimes just allow and adapt your session and allow them to kind of come in. And, you know, you'll know that anyway by getting to know them, but allow them to maybe decide on a warm up game or a cool down. And it gives the onus to them as well because that will make them feel included. And what the research is, is suggesting is that, you know, athletes need to feel competent and they need to feel autonomous in their learning if they want to be internally motivated. So sometimes, I'm not saying all of the time, but like, allow them, ask them, do you like that activity or what, what could we do next week? Right, I want you now girls to come up with a warm up. Right, give them that onus as well. That will then obviously allow for greater engagement, enjoyment levels and, and motivation levels. So this, I suppose, is important. This whole kind of team cohesion is important, particularly with restrictions and with COVID-19 and 
with all the talk of like, you know, staying apart and social distancing and things like that. I'm sure you, in your own clubs, you've had challenges over the last few months um, with that whole kind of team social cohesion. Um, it has been difficult. And you know what? It's something I suppose we haven't been able to control. Um, and it's so important, like obviously friendship and social interactions were coming up as the main barriers for girls. So it is obviously important for them. Um, so I suppose like what I'm kind of, what I want to highlight is that how can you think outside of the box? Um, we don't know what the, what, what's going to happen with restrictions, particularly in the new year now and over the coming weeks. We're in level five at the moment. We're hoping to go back to level three, but like we could potentially be in a lockdown again in the new year. So I suppose as a coach, you need to be thinking outside the box. And you need to be creative in terms of promoting that team spirit. So I'm talking about if it can't be done inside of training, how can it be done outside outside of training so that you're still enhancing that team spirit and you're still promoting that social interaction. So I know um, some clubs in all sports have run some Zoom workouts, some circuits um, to try and get their athletes involved. You know, they've run some nutrition kind of talks or They've done some skill related strength and conditioning kind of workouts. Um, posting on social media has also been kind of trending as well during lockdown. And um, some players and coaches you know, you've seen on Twitter and Instagram have kind of been posting skills and drills of the day and um, running competitions. All of these things will help promote the team spirit. And like as a coach, some of you probably have already done, um, have implemented these over the lockdowns over the last few months. Um, if not, it's definitely something to consider going forward because we don't know what's going on in the world with this whole pandemic. So we need to kind of have a plan B and we need to be thinking outside the box always. Um, I know myself over lockdown, um, I posted drills, drills and skills of the days. So I did like a five week challenge uh, for young girls, football specific, and it really took off. And, you know, parents got involved and it just created that sense of, of enjoyment and that social interaction and just the momentum to keep the momentum up socially for girls and I found it really really positive so definitely as a coach you should be considering um, these kind of examples um, Lillian brought to my attention there yesterday that this 17 year old girl I think her name is Erin up in at an athletics club in Sligo and um, she actually took initiative herself and she's only 17 bearing in mind and she started to post some skills um, and drills videos during lockdown um, inspiring the, the athletes and the youth in her own club so like instead of you being the one always you know doing the the circuits get the athletes to empower each other and get the girls to empower each other like fair play to that girl like she garnered massive attention not only in her club but she also inspired youth in other clubs around Ireland so like get your your athletes role models in the club, maybe some of the older athletes to get involved, all of that will help in terms of uh, creating that team spirit. Because remember, that's what's coming through in the research. They want to be with their friends. They've been starved of that due to lockdowns, you know, with the whole social distancing and stuff. It's been very hard, but there are other ways that you can try and, and, and I suppose, put the glue together and get that bond going uh, for girls. So I just put this question to you, really, you know, how socially stimulating are your sessions? You know, do you in, include fun teamwork? Do you include activities allowing girls to have that social interaction and bond? So what I mean that, I mean, like, it doesn't necessarily have to mean like, oh, we're going to spend 15 minutes now on a fun teamwork challenge. Like it could literally be at the start of a journey session, allow the girls to chat uh, and mingle for five minutes. Girls love to chat and you know it yourselves, they won't, they won't shut up essentially in some of the sessions in between journals and stuff. So allow them, you know, that they'll respect that because they, they're going to chat. I don't know. Instead of giving out for chatting, just say, look, I'm going to give you a minute now to, to at the water break, put amongst each other and then focus then again for the drills and the skills. Or else you could provide a fun teamwork activity, whether it be, um, you know, a, a leadership kind of one where they have to work together in different teams and the best team will win. They have to work on a team challenge. There are numerous team challenges on YouTube, online, loads of resources specific to your sport that you can include. And like I always say to myself at the training session, have I, have I incorporated a fun social game or a moment in my training session? Because that's what they want. So give them more of what they want, essentially. 
I know now we're kind of tight for time and things. So um, I suppose I kind of want to just kind of end, I suppose, really, um, kind of bring together some practical tips. So already we've went through the motivators, the barriers, what the research has said, um, the importance of the coach athlete relationship um, and, and the whole notion of like team coaching and how you can go and get box creatively to try and, and, and provide that for girls. So in terms of overcoming dropout, really, like there are numerous things you can do essentially, um, and it all depends on what issues you have in your club. One thing I suppose that's popping up for um, most coaches is that kind of like idea of the, the academic pressures. Um, and I suppose like it's inevitable, like, you know, girls are going to be put under pressure, particularly as they go into secondary school and exam years. So like kind of practical tips really for you as a coach, like talk with the parents, talk with the athletes as well, um, particularly around academic pressures. And like what I mean there is that like you need to kind of highlight and stress and educate to the parents that like being involved in sport is like so beneficial for academic performance. Like there's so much research out there that can link academic performance and involvement in sport. Um, I think there was a recent study actually with leaving their students um, And they found in sports, say, during the Leaving Cert actually ended up getting higher results than those who didn't, uh, those who didn't participate in sport for that year alone. So, like, you know, it, it's it's obvious we do know the benefits, but like, stress and highlight that to the parents. You know, whether it be just talking indirectly, informally, or maybe organising a meeting or organising, you know, someone to talk to them about the importance of it. Because at the end of the day, you know, we want girls to be staying involved even if they're doing their exams as well. And your role as a coach, you can't really control it to a certain extent, but you can help alleviate the pressures by talking to parents and, and athletes as well. Question your goals. So, you know, what are you trying to achieve? Like, are your expectations realistic? Um, in terms of like, you know, if you have a group, say, of, of, of girls that are doing their leaving cert, uh, for example, or their junior cert, and you can, you know, you can sense that they're under pressure. Like, are you putting too much of an expectation on them you know are your training sessions too hard do you like do what's your goal like maybe you need to revise and maybe you need to adapt your goal and again that comes down to talking with them and getting to know what what they want you know what are their goals what, what do they want to achieve maybe just year alone maybe it's uh, stepping back slightly in terms of training work uh how hard the sessions are etc you need to communicate that and you need to be clear with your your athlete and and that the parents as well um, and obviously be supportive and mindful look i mean like at the end of the day sport is just one aspect of their lives um, but it is an important one and like that's they go there to to get that outlet as well physically and mentally um now i don't think we had we had we had envisioned to have breaking out into breakout rooms with a, a kind of real life scenario so i suppose um liliane or claire do you want to just jump in here um, yeah, I'll, and... I'll break everyone up into a room. So if you're on your phone, you might have to just double check if you can actually accept the room. Um, if you don't mind chatting to other people, hopefully that's okay. Um, and you can and jump in. But we will if you, if you need to pop off, that's no problem. Yeah. We're just going to break people up into. Oh yeah, I, I'm, I might just briefly go through this first, yeah, um, Lilia, before you break them out. So like we kind of wanted um to give you kind of I suppose a real life scenario. Um just because I suppose there are numerous factors and barriers that can get in the way. Um, but something I suppose, based on your own responses in, in the registration survey, but also um, just the key barriers that were coming through, we wanted to kind of put a real life scenario there for you. So we, we picked, um, I suppose, Rosie. So Rosie is a 17 year old girl. Um, she's heading into sixth year. Um, you know, she's great, um, I suppose, academic, uh, aspirations and the points are quite high she's also worried about getting the points and she believes she should drop out of rowing due to time demands of the sport she really kind of thinks look she doesn't have time to do anything because she's really trying to prioritize her studying because she wants to get the points so Rosie is the eldest in her family and she's the first to sit her leaving cert and her parents are quite uncertain and unsure whether she should be spending time at her studies over training um, and some of her friends have also stopped but some have kept going um, and Rosie's kind of just torn in between like 
should I stop for the year? Should I, um, you know, back, try and balance both of them? Some of my friends have stopped, others have, have dropped out. Um, she's kind of unsure, her parents are unsure as well. So she's kind of in limbo and she needs to make a decision. So the question really we put to you is like, what do you, what would you do as a coach to prevent Rosie from dropping out? Um, and what changes essentially would you make to her training environment? Um, particularly if she, you know, decides to, to stay involved or if she's on the verge of dropping out. Um, what would you do as a coach? So I suppose really we're going to break into rooms for like about eight minutes. Um, now, obviously, I completely appreciate that some of you are on the go and things like that. Um, I would really encourage you to just get engaged as much as you can. There'll probably be around four or five in a breakout room. Um, like really what we want to get across is just to first of all, obviously introduce yourself and it really just come up with even two or three strategies um, that you could do as a coach to prevent Rosie from dropping out. So again, just to highlight, look, she's, she's going into leaving cert year. She's under pressure with exams. Um, she's unsure. That's the key word. She's unsure whether she should drop out. Um, she, she's kind of stressed because she feels she doesn't have time. Um, and also her parents are kind of undecisive. Um, so the three issues here really are the demands of her, of her studying, her parents are unsure, and thirdly, her friends are kind of in and out as well. So there's kind of three things popping into play there. So I suppose really what, what we want you to do is just before you break into the rooms, if you can even think of two or three things, great. It's only eight minutes. Whatever you put into it, you get out of it. Now's your opportunity. There's 121 participants here. Like use this time now to to talk to other coaches um, and try and come up with even two or three possible solutions.
Perfect. Is everyone back? I'm not sure there yet, or let's say, hang on. Oh yeah, I can wait anyway. Yeah, you can just give me the heads up when we have most. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. So again, look, um, obviously just with time restraints and things like that, um, ideally we'd like to chat all day, but it's just nice to get an idea of where other kind of coaches, just to communicate with other coaches as well. Um, so I suppose the main thing there, like again, I won't delay, but the, mo the main thing there um, is just like obviously communicate with, with uh, Rosie and her parents and just highlight that uh, the positive benefits um, that she taking part in sport and her studies um, will have on, on her leaving cert or her junior cert or, or whatever and I suppose maybe consider like adapting um, or maybe it's do you want to compete this year do you want to just you know participate do you want to like get to know what your player wants um, ask Rosie um, and like as I was saying um, I know Samantha I was in one of the regular rooms with Samantha and I was saying like really you can't really control that they have their leaving cert that they have external pressures all you can do is like highlight and promote them to be be at the training session and like you have them for 60 minutes or however long the session is like make sure that 60 minutes is like a, a positive experience for them that they that's their outlet and that they will want to come back so like that's all you can control is that 60 minutes and obviously that communication with parents and with rosie um, and friends etc but like control the controllables as i always say so the take-home messages, um, again, like obviously just based on this whole presentation, um, one of the most important things is just knowing your athletes. Like it has to be needs-driven. Every group of players, every um, team, athletes, whatever, whoever you're coaching, it's a different dynamic. You know, they have different personalities, different wants, different needs, different demands, different motivators, different barriers. Like you need to make that conscious effort as a coach to chat your athletes, whether that be you know, an informal meeting or just a chat for a few seconds and um, just ask them. It's a really simple strategy, um, but you need to do that. You need to take initiative on that as, as a coach. The second thing I would, I would say would be like try and allow for opportunities for fun and friendship in your, in your sessions. Like girls, as we know, like it's that whole social interaction, that social environment that they thrive in. You need to allow that to happen, allow the girls to mingle. Um, obviously, it's, it's difficult now with COVID-19, etc. But, you know, team challenge activities, ease and chat. They love to chat, I was, as I was saying, chat at the water break. Um, outside of training, you need to be looking at alternatives. What can you be doing to build up that positive team social interaction and that momentum? Things like Zoom, things like videos, get the athletes involved, get the community involved. You know, really, really push that. Um, outside, like sometimes it's the social events that the girls actually really like look forward to, um, not only in training but outside of training as well. Um, and then thirdly, this notion of healthy competition. So again, what I would suggest is like have balance between fun and competitiveness. Um, like I know even in some of my trainings, like with with the Cork ladies, like the most competitive trainings and the trainings that were the toughest were also like the most enjoyable training. So you can, you can merge the two together. Um, and you'll know, you'll know by their body language, you'll know by their reaction, if they're enjoying it, if they feel it's too much for them. Um, but that's your job essentially, right? You, you need to provide that platform. Like you need, essentially they want, they want to work hard as well. And they've got the best out of themselves in the session. But you, you need to allow for that kind of fun and enjoyment merging the two together so that they're leaving the training session feeling good about themselves. Fourthly, I would definitely, I would definitely, I suppose, encourage like that athlete voice and choice. Um, again, it's coming up in the literature all of the time, like girls want a voice um, and they want to be able to, to choose 
Um, I'm not, not again, like I'm not saying that they have to take over the whole training session, but like ask them what comes down to communication, give them autonomy, give them that kind of onus in the training session for maybe, I don't know, maybe it's the warm up and um, engage their interests. So like re- you have to remember that like your, your training sessions and your planning and delivering, it has to be specific to their needs. So what they want, give them more of what they want essentially. So ask them what they like, ask them what they dislike. In other words, what do they want more of? Um, and they feel, they feel included and they feel part of the training session. And that's going to have a direct, direct um, link to their internal motivation. They will want to come back to the training session. Uh, this positive social support. So again, just be mindful like of all the external perceived pressures. Talk to parents, as I was saying, talk to other coaches maybe. You know, if, if an athlete is involved in, in other sports, talk to other athletes, you know, have that compromise there. Um, you know, if an, if your player, say, if Orla had a, a match during the day with school and she trained that night, like, you know, talk to your player. Like, maybe it's a, it's just, look, Orla, I think you should just do the warm-up here and, you know, just, just be present at training, but you don't have to do the full training session. Um, be aware there of like athlete burnout and things like that as well. Um, and just communication, like that can literally be alleviated with communication. Be understanding and adapted, like always have empathy for them. Purposeful praise and encouragement. So confidence, confidence, confidence. You want them, you want to foster that confidence, whether it be skill related, whether it be, you know, the effort that they're putting into the training sessions, whether it be the leadership skills they're showing. It doesn't necessarily have to be skill related. It could just be, you know, the teamwork as well. Um, and like they should be smiling like uh, that's so so important like we really really have to feel a good factor um i remember just on this note um i remember eamon ryan again one of like i suppose it was a privilege to be coach under him um really really um positive coach coaching experience and i i'll never forget one thing he he used to say was that coaching is like a business and like you need to provide that service for your athlete. So for example, if I went into a restaurant or a hotel, um, at the moment, I'd love to be in there with, with it would have been closed. But if you went into a hotel, let's say, and you got a really good service, so you'd great food, you had a lovely experience, you felt good about yourself, like t- nine times out of 10, you will want to go back to that hotel or restaurant because you, you the experience there was positive and you enjoyed it and you felt good about yourself. So it's the exact same thing with coaching. Coaching is is like a business. Like your athletes that you have in front of you for that sixty minutes, like essentially your job is done if they're smiling going off and if they've in, if they've got the most out of the session. Yes, they could be tired, but are they happy leaving? Like you have to have to get that into your head, um, because if they don't feel good about themselves, that's going to affect their confidence. You know that might affect them socially with the whole social comparison, and like they mightn't turn up. They mightn't want to turn up. And you you want to put it on them. They want to be internally motivated. You don't want to be externally motivating them to come long term. You want them to be internally motivated so that they enjoy the session, so that they can come back the next day. Um, so I suppose just to kind of end, like again, just to like reiterate and to highlight like that it is a massive problem at the moment in Ireland. And um, like by the age of 13, one in two young women are dropping out of sports. So like that's a massive figure. Like and unfortunately it is still happening um girls are, are three times more likely in ireland to drop out of sport than boys um so like really i i, I just really like to, to put it on you um and to highlight that look as a coach like you can be that positive difference you can control some things like control the controllables you know remember that sport is only one aspect of their life yes it's an important aspect but like what you do with your athletes in that training session, the positive relationships, you know, the, the praise, the feedback, all of those positive things that you can bring into your training sessions, like that can be the difference between a girl dropping out in your club or a girl staying on in your club. So like you have that power and you have that influence um, and just use it, like use it to your advantage, really. Um, if there are numerous resources out there and um, care and um Liliana are going to take you through some specific resources out there for girls. Um, and like, as I said, um, feel free to email us as well um, if you have specific 
uh, questions that you didn't get a chance to ask today or that we didn't get a chance to answer. Um, but there's loads out there. Like, and, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of doing some research yourself. Sometimes it, other times it's a matter of actually just asking your own players and coaches and parents or looking for the resources that are out there. So I think um, Claire or Liliana are just going to take you through yep. these two resources. Um, can you hear me there? Yeah. Um, just thank you so much, Orla. You've done an absolute whirlwind tour of women of retaining girls in sport. But uh, there's two resources, one specifically to rowing and another to um, athletics. Uh, the rowing mojo uh, was actually developed by Paul Reynolds, who kindly joined the presentation from the Women's Sport Network. Uh, it is available for free online, but we're also going to put it up on our website that you can order a, a copy. And um, they also have a number of other sports on their own women's sport network. Uh, so a similar, find your mojo for, for lacrosse, I think, and football. Um, and it covers some really good topics. And similarly, Lillian has developed a, a handbook to keep girls enjoying sport as well and more geared towards athletics. So um you probably see more to come from them in the next few weeks, I'd say. Yeah, perfect. So I suppose, um, sorry, then I'll just get back. Oh, yeah. So, uh, Mila Mahagwiv, um, again, look, it's, it was the first workshop. Um, so, like, obviously, it's, what, an hour and a half. Um, so, like, we can't cover everything. But I just hope that it gave you some sort of food for thought in terms of, like, getting to know your own players. And, like, even if you just take two or three things that you learned from today and you implement it in your next training session, um, fantastic. And like, you know, at the end of the day, we're all in this together, like, and we all want more girls to stay involved. We, we're all, you know, we all have the same issues going on in our clubs um, and we're here to support each other as well. So like, don't hesitate to contact um, Claire, Liliana or myself and we'd be happy to help in terms of advice, um, additional resources or just to answer any desiring questions that you have. Um, and yeah, Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks very Thank much. you, Orla. If anybody has any questions, uh, don't worry. You can you can run off away now home uh, if you want to, but we can answer any questions as well if there's any specifically uh, for Orla, Claire or myself. Um, we'd be delighted to chat to you. Yeah. So you can just, you can, um, I'll, I'll let